school for me, I don't know about you, some of us had positive experiences, some of us had negative experiences, but, but school for me was mostly a positive experience, uh, mostly being the, the key word there, okay, I know you'll find this statement hard to believe, but I was sort of known as being uh, a clown at times in high school. I know that's, that's hard for you to believe, but believe it or not, uh, that reputation would, would get me into trouble once in a while. Is the weirdest thing. Um, I had at times a tendency to say uh, words out loud without first weighing the meaning of those words and, and how those words may affect people, okay? I remember uh, joking in a hallway of my school with a friend one time, one afternoon, um, who was a good two feet shorter than I was. Uh, he was Hispanic and I was, of course, whiter than a box of Q-tips. And uh, Anyway, we had one of those relationships, right? We could joke, we could kid about anything, like anything was okay. We could joke about racial stereotypes, you name it, we, we wouldn't get offended. But I found two very important things out about my friend that afternoon that I hadn't previously known. One was that he was extremely strong and that he somehow disguised all that strength in his four foot little man body that he had. And the second thing that I found out was that making fun of his height, or in his case, the, the lack of height, um, was apparently way out of bounds for him. Racial stereotypes, making fun of each other's families, calling each other names, it was all good. But calling him short, I was just out of line. And I remember after calling him short, a very brief interaction occurred with him that involved him pinning me up against the nearest wall and me soon after losing consciousness. Uh, he had thrown me so hard up against the wall that the impact had caused me to, to pass out. And I remember lying on the ground, coming slowly back into consciousness with him standing over me, which wasn't very impressive because he was short and he's pretty much at eye level with me down there. But I remember the concern that he had in his eyes. I could tell, you know, that he instantly regretted his actions. It's funny, but that reaction seemed to change the entire dynamic of our relationship. From that point on, we were noticeably more patient with one another, and our relationship seemed to take a, a turn toward a more gentle side. I didn't make any more short jokes either. But all because I was first pinned to a wall. There's a story in the Bible that we're going to look at this morning that involves another man, King Saul, being pinned to a wall. And it was because of him being pinned to a wall that the entire dynamic of Israel was about to change. With the pinning of Saul on a wall, or as my title this morning says, the fall of Saul, who was pinned to a wall, y'all, formatting must have got messed up there. Um, we took a southern turn this day, I don't know. But with his being pinned to a wall, and with his death, a, a new king would soon take the throne of Israel. This new king, of course, would be the great King David, in whom Jesus Christ would descend from. By the way, this, this message is an adaptation of a Bible study that, that we did in our Through the Bible class that takes place in the North Wing on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. If you're not part of that class or you're not part of any life group around here on Sunday, let me encourage you to get involved in them. Um, in, our, in our class, we study the Bible and we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. If you've never read the Bible, if you struggle to understand it, or if you have been through it a hundred times and, and you teach it, there's still something for you in this class. It's amazing to me, uh, me to like just today, Dale was teaching and the insights that other teachers bring and the, and the things that we get to add as a group, it's, it's amazing. So I'm, I, I invite you all, get involved, come check us out. You're, you're definitely invited. But before we dive into 1 Samuel 31 this morning, let me just say one thing. I believe Jesus is on every page of scripture. I really do. I believe that the scriptures use real life events in the Old Testament, like the ones that we're going to read about today, to display to us truths found in Christ or truths found later in the New Testament. I love teaching through the Old Testament, but I, but I think we do the word of God a disservice, and I think I do you all a disservice, if we fail to connect the stories that we read in it to the person of Jesus Christ. See, the great theologian, pastor, Charles Spurgeon, 
He said, no Christ in your sermon, sir, then go home and never preach again until you have something worth preaching. So as we, as we read this chapter together this morning, see if you can figure out how it relates to and foreshadows Christ. See if you can see how these true historical stories point to spiritual truths or principles that we find today in the New Testament. So 1 Samuel chapter 31, if you have your Bibles or you can reference the screens. Starts out and says, now the Philistines one of Israel's hated enemies, attacked Israel. And the men of Israel fled before them. Many were slaughtered on the slopes of Mount Gilboa. The Philistines closed in on Saul, the king at the time, and his sons, and they killed three of his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Melchishua. First off, I've always wondered how Saul, as a parent, started off naming his first son with a generic name like Jonathan, and then by the time he got to his third son, he names him Melchishua. I just, I don't know how that happens. But anyway, parents, I want us to notice something. Just prior to the Philistines attacking Israel here in this story, King Saul had an interaction with the Lord. In this interaction, Saul was told by God through the prophet Samuel that because of his continual disobedience, that his kingdom would be torn away from him and it would be given away to a rival king, to David. The Lord also tells Saul that because of his disobedience, his constant rebellion, his callousness to God's will, that he would hand him, his sons, and the entire army of Israel over to the Philistine people. God said it was then in this battle that we're reading uh, that Saul and his sons would die. Parents, how you walk with the Lord matters in the lives of your children. Your own personal obedience or disobedience will affect your kids. Uh, My wife and I, we were down in the Bahamas this past week on vacation. We were suffering for the Lord. Okay, somebody had to do it. Uh, Just kidding. We actually went down there on a cruise with uh, Derek and Jessica Hunt, friends of ours. Uh, We were all celebrating our our 10-year wedding anniversaries. Um, Not together, like married together, but two separate 10-year anniversaries. That'd be weird. That'd be a different kind of church, right? Like a Utah church out there somewhere, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, we're in, the, we're in the marketplace area on Nassau, right? And there's a guy selling conch shells. And not having anything from the ocean that my kids can constantly annoy us with, we went over and we purchased one. And then right next to this conch, la- uh, this conch guy selling these shells was a nice lady selling jewelry, And we we struck up a a small conversation with her, and I found out that she was a a very solid Christian woman who who used her platform as a jewelry salesperson to share her faith with tourists. Pretty cool. And as we're talking, she brings up the subject of politics, which I thought was awesome because that's exactly what I wanted to talk about when I wasn't in the United States on my vacation. But in that conversation... She said something interesting that I I think applies to our role as parents. She said that when something politically or ideologically catches hold here in America, it soon catches on in the Caribbean. She said if America sneezes, the Caribbean catches the cold. Actually, just this week I was too happy and I was excited, so I wanted to become depressed, so I started reading the news and uh, (laughs) I saw this headline that said, Caribbean island of Dominica will ban plastic straws and styrofoam. Now, where would they get that idea? See, this lady, I think, knew exactly what she was talking about. How many times in your relationships with your kids have you figuratively sneezed and seen your children catch the cold? I see this every day with my daughter Riley, a model to her, a dad who is playful, who likes to tickle, who likes to wrestle, a dad who is overtly sarcastic. And when I sit Riley down and, and I, have a, I try to have a serious discussion or I try to have nightly devotions with her, it's like trying to talk to a kangaroo in the middle of a, a sugar rush sometimes. <laughs> I often look at my wife and I'm like, who is this girl? Like, where does all this craziness come from? In which she taps me on the shoulder and kindly reminds me that I created this monster. (laughs) 
Those are the funny things we like to see in our kids. But it's our own weaknesses, our impulses that we don't like to pass down in our children that sometimes rear their ugly heads, don't they? If you model yelling in your home or, you know, to shore up an argument, expect your kids to catch that cold. If you have little priority for the word of God or attending church, expect your children to follow suit, even to to take it to the extent of doing what you do or didn't do in excess. Any substance that we may put in our bodies, any words that come out of our mouths, any attitudes that we carry, we are modeling behaviors to our children that we should expect to see crop up later on in their lives. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I'm afraid the Bible, uh, this principle that we find in the Bible works in the opposite direction as well. We can inadvertently train up our child in the way that they aren't supposed to go and see them not depart from that later in their lives as well. I speak in general terms, of course. So what's the solution? How do you, as a godly parent, parent and parent well, how do we raise godly children in a generation where we need more godly children? And the answer is for you, parents, to read your Bible. It's for you to stay obedient to what it tells you to do. And it's also to pray a lot. Amen? Saul, however, in our story, this king of Israel, he does his own thing. He often lived by his own rules and lived in constant rebellion to the Lord. That rebellion not only ended up costing him his throne, but it cost three of his sons their very lives. Then after the death of his sons, verse 3 of our passage continues and says this. It says, the fighting grew very fierce around Saul, and the Philistine archers caught up with him and wounded him severely. Saul groaned to his armor bearer, take your sword and kill me before these pagan Philistines come to run me through and taunt and torture me. But his armor bearer was afraid and wouldn't do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When his armor bearer realized, I love that, that Saul was dead, he fell on his sword and died beside the king. I love how this translation says that the armor bearer realized that Saul was dead. Like, I wonder what tipped him off. Was it the large sword protruding out of Saul's body, or was it the pool of blood that he was laying in that brought about the alarming revelation? (laughs) Regardless, though, the armor bearer falls on his own sword, and verse 6 says, so Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, the genius that he was, and his troops all died together that same day. See, God had judged Saul for his rebellion, for his sin. Now things get even worse. When the Israelites on the other side of the Jezreel Valley and beyond the Jordan saw that the Israelite army had fled and that that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their towns and fled. So the Philistines moved in and occupied the towns. It was suddenly a buyer's market. Then the next day, when the Philistines went out to strip the dead, they found the bodies of Saul and his three sons on Mount Gilboa, sitting there, laying there dead. So they cut off Saul's head and stripped off his armor. In other words, they saw Saul and sawed off his head. It was a no-brainer that he was truly dead. No? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop before I'm ahead. Uh, yep. Verse 9 goes on and says, After they cut off Saul's head, they proclaimed the good news of Saul's death in their pagan temple and to the people throughout the land of Philistia. So they're, they're running around, they're sharing this news that Saul's dead. You could say that it was a headline, okay? Uh, it's just too easy. It's too easy. I'm sorry. Verse 10. They placed, his <laughs> they placed his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths, and they fastened his body to the wall of the city of Bethshan. Much in the same way the, the Israelites once kept and displayed Goliath's sword as a war trophy, the Philistines now display King Saul's armor in their own God's temple. And additionally, they take Saul's dead, headless body, and they place it on a wall in Bethshan. 
Why would they do this? It's because to dismember a body and then leave it unburied, that's the height of disgrace. That's the height of shame for a victim and their family and or their nation. So in response to this great disgrace, verse 11 says, but when the people of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their mighty warriors traveled through the night to Beth Shan and took the bodies of Saul and his sons down from the wall. They brought them to Jabesh where they buried the bodies. Then they took their bones and buried them beneath the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and they fasted for seven days. Let's unpack this amazing portion of scripture and then we will be done this morning. And as you're listening, where is Jesus in all of this? Have you found him yet? This is the part you're gonna want that morning coffee to start kicking in because the word of God is awesome, okay? So after Saul here is killed and after his body is abused and stripped of its possessions and after his head had been lopped off, the Bible says that the people of Jabesh Gilead mobilized themselves to recover Saul's body. What would move the people from Jabesh Gilead to risk their lives and remember their fallen king? What caused them to march throughout the night to recover his body? Forty years before this story, Saul was anointed king of the people of Israel. Certain Israelites at that time, they applauded the fact that Saul was being made king, while others desired not to have this hick farmer uh, rule over them, my translation. So Saul, having this country divided over him, became or becoming king, decides to play it safe, and he goes home uh, to the ranch on, on Gibeah, at Gibeah. But then... While he's doing that, there's an enemy ruler named Nahash, a name that literally means serpent, who went up and besieged the town of Jabesh Gilead, Jabesh Gilead being an Israelite city. It was here he told the people of Jabesh Gilead that he would not kill them if they would make a treaty with him. This treaty had one condition, and that one condition was that Nahash would be allowed to gouge out the right eyes of every one of the men of the city of Jabesh. So the people of Jabesh Gilead, they took a vote, and they voted all nays and no eyes. But why did Nahash, why did Snake Man want to gouge out the right eye of the men of Jabesh Gilead? It's because every man who could fight would fight with their right hand and they would hold a shield with their left hand and having no right eye would incapacitate these men from from fighting. To fight, they would have to strain their body outside of that shield, exposing much of the area of their body. They would not be able to fight. Are you guys seeing this? You getting this? (laughs) Nahash the serpent is like Satan, the serpent. He's always seeking to blind people and incapacitate them from knowing or serving the Lord and his army. He wants to take you, Lifehouse, out of the fight. He wants to take you out of the battle. But in this story, one of the elders of Jabesh, he speaks up and uh, he tells Nahash that they want seven days to be able to send messengers out into Israel to find an army to come and rescue them. Nahash, who's not only a snake, but also an idiot, incredibly agrees to this and says, okay, you have seven days to find a rescuer. Now, why would Nahash agree to give them seven days to find a rescuer? Two reasons, I believe. Two, not three. Two. One, I think he was overconfident and arrogant. And two, I believe Nahash knew the history of Jabesh Gilead, and he didn't think anyone was going to come to their defense. What do I mean? If we go back even farther in the Bible to Judges chapter 19, we see a horrible story about a Levite cutting up the body of his dead concubine, his wife, into 12 separate pieces. That's really in the Bible. Horrible things had been done to this concubine in the land of Israel by a tribe of people who were of the Israelites. This concubine, she was raped by a gang of Benjamites all night and then left on the doorstep of her husband, this Levite, where she then died. 
This Levite then, to prove a point, he cuts up his concubine wife into 12 separate pieces and he sends one piece to each of the 12 tribes of Israel. All of Israel is then enraged and they all meet together and they all decide to to wipe out the Benjamites, this tribe of Israel who had committed this horrible atrocity in their own land. Israel that day, they made a covenant and said that anyone who failed to assemble at the council that they were having in response to this atrocity was to be put to death as well. Guess what city didn't come to the party? It's the city of Jabesh Gilead. No one from that city showed up. So 12,000 fighting men from Israel were sent into Jabesh Gilead to kill all the people, the men, the women, the children alike, except for those who were still virgins. Then Nahash, this evil ruler, he, he knew the bad history of Jabesh Gilead and that it was an outcasted city amongst the Israelites. He knew that they had a bad name. He knew they were the weird Uncle Eddie no one wanted around on, on Christmas morning. Yes, I just made a Christmas vacation reference. But more importantly, not only was Jabesh Gilead an outcasted and hated city, but this city was on the wrong side of the Jordan River. God originally told the Israelites to go into the land of promise and take the land, but some decided that they liked how things were on the east side of the Jordan River, outside the land of promise. So they built some towns there. Jabesh Gilead was one of these towns, full of people who wouldn't follow the Lord's command to take the land that he had already promised to them. So this evil ruler Nahash believed, I believe, that no one would come for these people now. These people of Jabesh Gilead aren't aren't people who are even inside the promised land of Israel. And, And Israel itself nearly destroyed these people years before he thought, surely no one's gonna come for you. But what Nahash didn't count on was the mercy of a king, King Saul. The Bible says that when word came to Saul about these Israelites in Jabesh Gilead who were about to have their eyes plucked out, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Bible says that Saul then took oxen and cut them up into pieces and sent these pieces to each of the tribes of Israel in the same way the Levite did with his concubine years before. Along with the cut up pieces of oxen, Saul sent to each of the tribes a message that said, this is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel to save these people of Jabesh. They'll be cut into pieces, in other words, just like this. Essentially, church, the same circumstances and methods that once rallied the Israelites together to extinguish the people of Jabesh Gilead are now being used to rally Israel to save them. What an amazing example of mercy. So in response, 330,000 men of Israel, they get this message from Saul and they show up for him ready to fight this Nahash guy. Saul and his army then march all night to the city of Jabesh Gilead. And when they get there, they slaughter the city and its enemies and they save all of their fellow Israelites. See, the people of Jabesh Gilead, they never forgot Saul's mercy and kindness. And now, some 40 years later, as Saul lies dead, decapitated, and naked, hung on a wall of Beth Shan, they remember So reminiscent of this, they they risk their own lives at great potential risk to themselves and they march all night to remove him from the wall. There's a principle all throughout the Bible of reaping what we sow. If you sow corn seeds, you're gonna harvest corn. If you plant apple tree seeds, you're gonna harvest apple trees in the spiritual realm. If you plant good seeds and you bless others, You will reap a good harvest and receive a blessing back. The same can be said if we plant bad seeds. If we do wrong, we should expect bad harvests. Of all the things that we have seen in Scripture, even in this story, of all the bad things that Saul has done wrong in his life, despite all his bad bad failures, despite all the bad seeds that he has sown, Saul got this one thing right. He planted good seeds by being merciful to the people of Jabesh Gilead. And then 40 years later, 
he had a harvest. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 9, it says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Church, have, have you been sowing good seeds? Have you been doing good and have you been being faithful to the Lord? Maybe you're looking around and you're like, I don't see any harvest. And maybe you're wondering why. Actually, for some of us, it, it seems like the more good we do or the more faithfully that we serve the Lord, the worse our circumstances get. Can I just encourage you this morning and tell you to not grow weary in doing good? Because at just the right time, according to God's promises, you will reap a harvest. That perfect time for Saul to reap his harvest was after he had died and hung lifeless on a wall. You may not be hung up on a wall this morning, but perhaps you feel like your back is up against one. Trust the Lord. Believe that your good seeds won't go unnoticed by God, but trust him with his timing. We have a saying in my house that I've used countless times and my girls have memorized it. We say, if you do good things, good things will happen to you. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. I've instilled in my girls that generally speaking, if they do good, good will result. If you study, if you read, if you pay attention, you're going to get good grades. But if you mess around and, and, you, and you sleep, chances are you're going to fail. The same is true for us as we live our lives, church. Do good, don't grow weary in doing good, and generally, good things will happen to you. See, sometimes we get waiting on the Lord to produce a blessing in our lives, but he's often waiting for us to get up and plant some seeds, to sow some seeds. No farmer in their right mind would ask God to bless his field without first going out and planting seeds. We have a part to play we have good to do, and if we do our part, we can expect our own harvest in God's timing. Amen? Amen. Uh, DeAndre, I want to go ahead and invite him up, and I'd also like the ushers to prepare for communion. We're going to take communion this morning. But as they come, let me show you how this passage speaks of Jesus and speaks of his mercy to us. See, when the people of Jabesh Gilead took Saul's body off of that wall in Beth Shan, after traveling there all night, they took him back to Jabesh, they burned his body because it was in such a mutilated state, and they buried Saul's bones under a tamarisk tree. See, we here at Lifehouse Church, you and I, we are like these people. We are like the people of Jabesh Gilead. What do I mean? Many of us have traveled, not all night maybe, but at least a portion of our mornings to remember our king who was nailed not to a wall, but to a tree. We come from Hastings, Grand Island, Red Cloud, Blue Hill, Kennesaw. We come from all over. The saying is a church alive is worth the drive, amen? See, while most everyone else stays home today, while most everyone else is sleeping in, some are mowing their lawn, some are going to the lake, some are planting a garden, you have chosen to be here. You have come to do what we do day after day, week after week, year after year. You have come to remember your king. You remember what he did for you, not 40 years ago, but 2,000 years ago on the cross. We come to remember what he is currently doing in our lives today, and we remember what he will do for us when he comes again. See, like the people of Jabesh Gilead, we remember our king who was nailed, spit on, and mocked. He was the one who rescued us, and we haven't forgotten like Saul, our king was, was nailed to a wall, the, the wooden cross of Calvary. Our king, who was worse than Saul, was nailed to a tree. But you say Saul was being judged by God. Saul was a rebellious man. He disobeyed God. He got involved in witchcraft. It's awful who Saul was. What's well, awful who Jesus was? What are you saying? 
The Bible says God made him, God made Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, our king, took upon him the sins of the world. He took onto himself all the sins of humanity and embodied it. He became sin, everything God hates. And God the Father, who looked on King Saul and had to judge him for his sins, looked upon Christ, who became the embodiment of sin, and he judged Jesus in the same way he judged Saul. Jesus was pinned to the cross naked. His humility was ugly. His agony was unbelievable. And we remember him as our king, our king who rescued us, us. my king who saved me eight years ago. When did he save you? Some, some 40 years, some 10, some relatively a short time ago. But while others are out there outside of these walls forgetting about him, continuing on with their lives, we are here to remember him this morning. That's why we are here, service after service, to remember our king fastened to the wall on the cross. And he was hung there. He was beaten, he was bruised, and he was decapitated. And wait a sec, you say Jesus wasn't decapitated, not physically, but spiritually. See, when Jesus, the head of the church, was on the cross, the disciples, save one, were scattered from him. The head was apart from the body when Christ was pinned to the cross. And on that cross, he hung there in humiliation. People mocked him. People made fun of him. It was there, then on the cross, that the fire of God's judgment burnt him. The wrath of the fires of God's righteous indignation were poured out on his son who had become sin. See, Jesus took the heat. He took the hell for us. In the same way in the story of Saul we're studying this morning, he too had become sinful, rebellious, iniquitous. He then was judged by God and he was put to death, mocked, made fun of, spit on, abused, burned. The men of Jabesh Gilead, the Bible says, took down Saul's body from the wall and they burned it. And then the Bible says that they took his bones and they removed them from the ashes and they buried them where? Under a tree. Our king was hung on a tree and even though he endured incredible amounts of abuse, he suffered no broken bones fulfilling the prophecy. And it was right there in the garden tomb in the same place that Jesus was hung on the cross that his bones were buried. If you've been to Israel or you've studied about the Holy Land or the burial of Jesus, perhaps you've seen that the garden tomb where Jesus was buried lays in the very shadow where he would have hung on the cross. It's an amazing story to me. And you and I are like these men of Jabesh Gilead. You today who say, I will remember my king. Others may not care, others may not come, but I will come to the Lord's table time after time after time. We too are like these men of Jabesh in the way that we are constantly being besieged by our enemy. Nahash, that serpent, he came to blind and incapacitate the people of Jabesh Gilead, but King Saul traveled all night to be the salvation for his people. You came, or Jesus came, to this earth to battle Satan, that slippery snake, to be our very salvation. See, we are the ones who are on the wrong side of the Jordan River. We are the ones living in, it, in disobedience to the Lord. We were the ones who failed to show up for the fight. We don't deserve the kindness nor the mercy of a king that traveled all night to save us. Nahash believed he had won and that the city of Jabesh Gilead would forever be blinded and then placed under his authority. But Nahash didn't count on the mercy of King Saul. 
You see, the devil may succeed in laying siege in your life. He may succeed in backing you into seemingly inescapable corners. He may threaten to darken your vision and take you out of the fight. But the devil didn't count on the great mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord has traveled all night to free you from the grip of the enemy. He has come to preserve your purpose and your sight. He has come to give you life. Does anybody see Jesus in this scripture yet? Do you understand how it all points to him? And we now come here to simply remember the king that first remembered us. We come to worship him. We come to to honor his name. And we will continue to do just that week after week, month after month, year after year.